Morning, guys and gals. It is day three, uh, Monday, uh, as we're doing this Easter week and just going through the, the process and kind of going through some of the, the steps that Jesus went through uh, that Passion Week. And, and to think about it, today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11, uh, dealing with verses 15 through 19. And I've just kind of entitled this little uh, study today, uh, This Place is is a wreck. And this is the Jesus cleansing the temple. And uh, so if you remember yesterday was the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, uh, comes in with all the pomp and circumstance and, and uh, the worship that he was uh, worthy, uh, far beyond worthy of receiving. And, and then he goes and spends the night in Bethany nearby. He comes the next morning uh, here to Jerusalem, uh, comes back to Jerusalem uh, as a uh, Mark records it here. He has the fig tree uh, as they come in and then the cleansing of the temple. And then it's the next day that Mark has uh, the fig tree that we actually just talked about in Bible study uh, last Wednesday. Uh, but here the, the cleansing of the temple kind of goes along with the, the, the fig tree a little bit. And the fact that, uh, as I mentioned even last week, that that Jesus was coming to the fig tree expecting to get fruit and as he came to the temple, he was expecting to see fruit of righteousness. And that is not what he found by any means. So let's look in God's word this morning. It's Mark chapter 11, 15 through 19. And God's word says this. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturn the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests, they heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when the evening had come, he went out of the city. But there's a couple of things here that I want you to notice uh, today. And uh, just to kind of set the scene a little bit, uh, in case you don't know. So if you take the, the temple complex is what he's talking about. And, and there was an innermost part that uh, was reserved only for Jewish believers, right? And, and, and so then this outer part was open to the Gentiles. And it was intended to be a place where they could come and pray. It was intended to be a place where even the rabbis and scribes there could go out and answer their questions about the one true God. And to think that that was the intention of this place. That was the intention of what's called the, the court of the Gentiles. But see, it, it, had, come so, it had become so busy there um, with selling and trading and, and all this going on. Basically, what was going on is all these people would come, especially for Passover, and they, they wanted to, to give, uh, at Passover, it was expected for them to pay the temple tax. And if they were out of towners, they needed to exchange their money. And the people there were just, they were ripping them off. And, and then you have ones that were selling sacrifices, which in itself sounds like a bad thing, but really, in and of itself was not a bad thing because out of town you could come and, and buy your sacrifice there so you know that it would be accepted. Um, and, and that was probably, it probably all started out all well and good. Um, but there again, they didn't have to do it in the temple area. That was reserved for, um, as I said, reserved for pray. Reserved for, as Jesus said, it should be known as a house of pray. But what happened somewhere along the way is it, maybe it started outside and it moved inside the temple complex area there. And, and now it had become so busy and even to the point where we read that it had become kind of a shortcut for everybody in town. Um, where now instead of having to walk all the way around this huge complex, now they could kind of cut through and make a shortcut. And see, could you imagine being a Gentile coming into this area and you, you want to learn about the one true God and, and maybe you want to worship the one true God and you come here to this place and all this busyness is going on. And, and then you're getting ripped off, right? I mean, you're getting ripped off by the ones who claim to be serving this one true God. 
Now, let me ask you honestly, who would want any part of that? What, what Gentile would come into that and really expect um, to be received and, and actually have any desire to, to have part of all this madness that was going on? So I get this picture, and as I told you yesterday, you know, my spiritual imagination sometimes, but as I see Jesus coming there in the temple, I guess maybe it's flashbacks. You know, I wasn't, I was never in the uh, military or never in the service, anything like that. I am very thankful for our veterans. But I guess my flashback would be my mom coming into my room and saying, what in the world? This place is a wreck. And it's kind of the same way that I do, I guess, with my kids today is I'll say, what in the world happened here? It looks like, you know, a tornado came through here. And then what do they say? Dad, we just cleaned it yesterday. And, you know, but that's a whole nother sermon in itself. But to think about it, how we make those same excuses with God, right? That we say, well, wait a minute. No, I've got it cleaned up. It's not really that much of a wreck. I've got this in this place and this in this place. And and I can hear the I can hear the Jews explaining themselves away and the, the scribes and Pharisees. Right? I mean, Jesus is really as he's as he's driving everybody out of the temple area. He's he's really there again, making it public that he does not approve uh, of what they have been doing and how they've been treating God's house. And so when Jesus comes in and, and, you know, like I said, I have this spiritual uh, imagination of coming in and saying, man, this place is a wreck. And and then he begins and proceeds to clean it himself. And, and, you know, as a child, if you see your parents start cleaning your room for you, you're thinking, oh, no, that doesn't go there. Oh, I was saving that. And and all these things start flashing through your mind and you're thinking, man, I should have done this before he got before they got here. And. I imagine, see, with with Jesus, as he's coming in, he said, this is my house. And and even as he tells them the two things that he tells them, he says that this is supposed to be known as a house of prayer for all nations. That's from Isaiah 56, verse 7. A a house of prayer for all nations. That that means that, that all nations, everybody, I don't care who they are, what color their skin is, where they were born, how short they are, tall tall they are, whatever, it doesn't matter, that everybody is welcome, right? Jesus said that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be, shall be saved, whosoever. See, he didn't, he didn't put any other, I mean, it was, yes, the gospel was for the Jew first and then for the, for the Gentile, but he said, whosoever will may come. And so now they had made this place that was welcoming in the Gentiles, all these nations, right, had welcomed them all in. And now they had made it a place that no prayer could go on. No, no worship could go on in a place like that. And maybe even today, you know, the the only thing that we have today to kind of compare this to is our church buildings. Right. And and even now, as we can't. we can't gather together uh, in them at the moment. But to think that, have we really kept them as a house of prayer? I mean, would our community, right? Would our area around here, would they look at our churches as houses of prayer? Or would they say, no, that's just where, you know, they just go up there and pretend to have church. Or they go up there to make themselves feel better. But but anyway, I just have to stop and think and, and wonder, are we inviting in every nation? Are we inviting in anyone and everyone to come hear the gospel? Not not to pat ourselves on the back, but are we allowing anyone and inviting anyone and everyone um, to come in to hear about the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ? But see, then that brings us to the second thing that, that he said. He says, you've made it into a den of thieves. Right. And it kind of gives this idea. This is where they were ripping everybody off. Right. They were trying to uh, it was big business there in the temple. And I mean, that's ridiculous. But the fact that it was big business it, and the fact that he said it was a den of thieves is kind of uh, reminiscent of the, the road uh, to, to Jericho from Jerusalem. It's, it was known because of the, the, the curves and the hills and, and mountains and everything that it was it was very dangerous to go because robbers could hide. Uh, but some commentators have pointed out that as he calls this, calls them the den of, of thieves here in the temple, it was almost like 
those robbers out there on the Jericho Road that were running and hiding in the cliffs, that now, wait a minute, the Jewish people, the scribes and Pharisees, are running into the temple to hide their sin. Now, that sounds so far-fetched, but if you really think about it, how many people today come and run to the church to hide what's really going on? How many come to just put on a front for everyone to hide what's really going on on the inside? Now, let's, let's take this to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17, the Bible says this, says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and, and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And if, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So see, the, the temple of God uh, today is not just a, a place like a building, like the church building. When we know now that the church has been deployed, right? The church has been sent out. But even more so than that, that as we talk about the temple of God, that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are the temple of God. The, God, the Holy Spirit resides inside you. So you are the temple of God. So let me tie all this all together for you today. If Jesus showed up today, this morning, right now, as, as you're watching this, if he showed up in your life this morning, what would he find? Would he, would he come to the door of your life and say, this place is a wreck? What would he find? I mean, would he find those, those seats of addiction? Would he find those tables that were covered with the love of money or material possessions? Or would it even be a shortcut there uh, to bypass God's word so you could get by with what you want to do? I just wonder, you know, what tables would he flip over in your life today? Who would he drive out? What, what negative influences in your life would Jesus drive out today? I don't know about you, but that makes me really have a, a self-examination to say, wait a minute, I am. My body, your body is a temple of the living God. It's not a tomb for a dead God. It's the temple of the living God. So what would Jesus find in your life today? It, it, what will he find in you? His temple. Will he be pleased with what he sees? Or will it immediately make him upset to the point that righteous indignation where he says, this place is a wreck. We need to fix it. I pray that the Lord will encourage you with this word today. And God bless you all. Have a great day.